I'd like to give a special thanks to our members who are here today. The members support the general operations of the center. We couldn't do it without you. If you are not a member yet, I encourage you to sign up at the front desk on the way out. Also, Bob will be signing books in the bookstore after. They make great stocking stuffers. So, and that'll be your chance to actually meet Bob. He may even shake your hand and you'll get an autographed book. Oh, Bob Richard, sorry. Bob Cole may show up to the book signing too, I didn't ask him. He may do it just for me. Anyway, uh, thanks to everyone who helped put this on. We've got Eric Simpson, Jeff Dunham, John Gallagher with the IT. We've got Sam Hannon, we got Jeff Schrin filming, we got Mac and myself. We get the ladies and uh, the graphics who did the lovely signs. But with that, I give you Bob and Bob. <laughs> Thank you. It's always fun to see all of you each time and coming back so often. Uh, Bob and I have been working on this and sharing photographs of his family and of Pahaska, and we've learned a whole lot more than we ever thought we were going to learn, and we're going to share it with you today. Uh, it's been a pleasure to work on this project, and the talk is supposed to last an hour. And we're going to ask you to hold the questions till we finish. And then if you, and most of you, I don't think have to hurry back to lunch or to work. But if you'd like to stay, I learned more in our practice with the questions that came from the staff that sat in on our practice talk. But it's the time to ask any question and Bob has the answer, Bob Coe. Yeah. I'm, I'm in support, but uh, I worked up there also, and uh, I think most people have. What year is Bob? 54 and 55, and you came along about that time. That's about right. <laughs> anyway, uh, we'd love to have you stay and partake in the question and answer at the end. Again, I'd like to thank the uh, Center of the West staff and everything they do to make this successful. And with that, we're going to get started. And uh, Bob and I are going to sort of fill this in. The uh, old lodge at Pahaska became or came on the National Register in what year? It's down there in the corner somewhere. 1973. 1973. And uh, it's worth in the summer to take a tour, Bob? Yeah, we have uh, a couple tour guides. One in the front row here is Linda McCoy and, uh, and Ron Pierce, and uh, it's open every day, you know, so uh, usually by nine in the morning it's open and through about five o'clock. We try to do it every day all summer, and sometimes in the spring and fall it's a little iffy. And, you know, it's probably a good time for me to say that my philosophy at Pahaska with the old lodge has always been to try to keep it as historically accurate and correct as it possibly could and, and uh, you know no new heating systems no uh, plumbing wiring and all those things and and uh, so anyway this is uh, this is an interesting picture here and uh, you see the horse and carriage there there's another picture uh, with a similar, probably with the same horse, same carriage, with Buffalo Bill standing there. And uh, it's a, we think, I think this possibly is when uh, Buffalo Bill purchased Pahaska. It was already a permit. Uh, you can see the front two, there's actually three cabins that I think were there before they built the lodge, which are the front three cabins at Pahaska now. And, uh, so, uh, Bob, I'll let you talk on this one. There's so many names, that's why you gave it to me. And Mac. <laughs> Iron Tail in the back there, you can see him on the Buffalo Head Nickel, right but in the back. This shows the front of the lodge, and uh, they're getting ready to go on a hunting trip. Next. Well, I'm just gonna uh, interject that this is uh, R. Farrington Elwell, who was a, a good friend of uh, Buffalo Bill, and who did a, a, a number of paintings for him. Um, quite a few of them of hunting trips that they went on. And this one uh, went up the North Fork somewhere. Um, we have a, another picture here that was taken at the same time. 
It's basically the same group of people. Mm -hmm. If you, uh, here's Buffalo Bill over here on the, uh, on the left. Right behind him, a step up, that's Iron Tail. Doesn't look quite like he, he usually does, but when he was out here in the West, he quite often wore uh, that uh, slouch hat and a, and a big thick coat. Uh, let's see here. Uh, this is Jakey Schwab, who was the proprietor of the Cody Trading Company. Um, up here, that's uh, George T. Beck. Um, why can I never say this guy's name? Mike Russell. Mike Russell, thank you. <laughs> thank he you was a good friend of Buffalo Bills, and he lived in Deadwood, South Dakota. Next. Front porch with Buffalo Bill standing there, and uh, it doesn't look much different today. Uh, there's some steps there in front. We'll see them a little later on. This is a brochure that went out, and the only reason we really put it in is look in the lower right-hand corner, and you'll see the first bridge headed to Yellowstone, and the middle fork is coming in just to the left. Mm -hmm. Next. That's probably pretty close to the bridge nowadays. This is uh, Buffalo Bill and uh, I've forgotten which one. Frank, Frank Powell. Frank Powell, uh, also known as White Beaver. And he was the builder of the lodge. And uh, that's in front of the fireplace. And he had two brothers. Uh, I think it's the next picture. Uh, this is all the Powell brothers, and I always ask people in Powell, is it, wasn't Powell named after these three brothers? And they, oh no, he's named after the famous guy that went down uh, the Grand Canyon. And I said, no, these men were famous too. And I can always get a rise out of somebody from Powell. <laughs> This is probably a pretty common deal up there, and uh, to have a band there like this was a big production. So you, you think back and you, you think, well, there must have been something pretty big going on in this deal, and perhaps it was the Prince was on the coming up or something, but this is obviously a rehearsal for a bigger event. This is the Wapita Inn, and uh, it's halfway between Pahaska and Cody. This is where Buffalo Bill stopped with his carriages or stagecoaches or uh, when he was riding horseback. And we have found when they tore this down in the 20s, we found parts of these, this building at Pahaska, and I'll point them out as we go along. This is at Elk Fork, and you're looking up Sweetwater. We had a historian uh, years ago that said, no, no, it's down there by the bridge in the school. And I said, no, that Wapita Inn started in 1945 when the Kings bought it and turned it from the Green Lantern into the Wapita Inn. So this is the true place of Wapita Inn. Next. This is another shot. Yeah, if you look, if you look carefully, you can see on one side it says Pahaska TP. 19 miles, Cody. and the other one says Cody. Next. There's a stagecoach on its way to Yellowstone. This is looking north, and where this sat, or you can see where it was, where you see a big yellow tri or re rectangular sign pointing to the campgrounds or slow is right where this sat, right next yeah. to the current highway. This is the uh, Basically, the western end of the Wapiti campground is where this sat. Mm -hmm. Next. Okay, I think we've had enough of that. This is the canyon after they built the dam, and we're starting to go up the dam hill, and you've already heard all about that. This it's, was done in 1914. They're trying to do business up there. Remember that. And, uh, I can tell you all about it. I can't imagine what it'd be like to try to run a business up there with this being the road. It's like, <laughs> you know. Uh, Bill DeMaris said that when they put automobiles in, that it, it, instead of a, a three-day trip to Pahaska, it became a four-hour journey. And uh, said they crossed the river th 30, 
Two Seven, times. 32 times or some phenomenal amount, you know. This is the porch of, or the inside the old lodge. If you look, uh, you see the buffalo skull. It's there and uh, uh, there's a lot of people conjectured that Teddy Roosevelt's in one of these pictures and he's not. Uh, we have no documented evidence that he's been here. Uh, my belief is, is that he probably, in fact, did say that the North Fork was the most scenic 50 miles in America. But uh, I don't think anybody's ever documented that he's been here. Uh, as, yeah. as you look at this, look at the cross beams. Yeah. And this was designed, and we'll see it in a few minutes, by A.A. A. Anderson, who was the uh, superintendent of the Yellowstone uh, for, Forest, Preserve. Forest Reserve, which later became Shoshone National Forest. Mm -hmm. uh, but he put the cross members with the A up there, two of them, and when you go in, you can look up and see his signature in his design. Next. Front porch. That's before the screen, porch. I think. But. Yep. And notice this is one of the, we're always looking for uh, Faye Hiscox's photographs. He was a photographer that also was a cinema photographer, and we haven't found the bulk of his photographs, but he went on Frost and Richard 18-day trips and photographed the complete trip, and I haven't found those yet, but we're still looking. Next. Yeah, that's... Uh, this is the fireplace as it, basically as it looks today. And uh, you can see the buffalo skull there. And uh, can you see the crack there? The Yellow, Yellowstone earthquake was pretty detrimental to it. And you can see the crack there next to the buffalo. And uh, you know, and if you looked at one of the previous pictures, you'll see that the chimney, which is river rock today, was actually tin. It was a tin pipe that went all the way up. And so when they, replace that tin pipe with the chimney, they just put the rocks around it. And so that was the demise of the chimney was that that old tin pipe kind of caved in on itself. The earthquake in 59, I was a park ranger at Lake, and uh, I could get into that story, but we won't. But uh, I wasn't very worried. I thought it was just a couple of bears on the roof of our cabin. <laughs> <laughs> it shook me out of my bed here in Cody. My mother grabbed me up, and out the door we went, screaming and carrying on. I was going, Go ahead, talk about this. Go ahead if you want. You know more about it than I do. Uh, this is an elk head that still hangs there, and behind it is a Cuban flag. And I had a group from the War College in Rhode Island with me this fall on a tour, and they took a tour of the uh, old lodge and they came back saying, oh, you've got to get a better flag. That one's starting to deteriorate. I says, but that's history. Uh, but it amazed me that I had all these Navy commanders and, and leaders from 40 different countries on tour stopping at Pahaska and going through Yellowstone. And they do this every year with uh, officers, senior officers from all over the world and many of them, and they've been doing this since uh, Admiral Nimitz started uh, after World War II, this training school, and they're here for one or two years, and they educate them about America and the way we run our country. Move along, Bob. Thank you. <laughs> Yours. So th this is the highway uh, traveling right out front of Pahaska. And, uh, I say highway loosely, but you can see the front three cabins there and uh, the main lodge uh, over in the background. And uh, that's, that's really a good look at the way it looked in those days. Here's a party headed for the park. Uh, been a long trip. Next. This is the dance pavilion. and. Uh, we, we always thought it was out front of the lodge, but you look at this picture, it's out behind the lodge there. And uh, so, but uh, it was for big events there, and they'd come up, and uh, Cody people, they had several trips a year. Uh, the Cody Auto Club 
partnered with Buffalo Bill to get the road where you could travel to Pahaska. And he subsequently gave him a, a, a spot there. We'll show you it later. There's the original bridge, or that's probably the second or third bridge. But you can see that's a, there's a big investment in that bridge. The state of Wyoming was putting forth there by then, I think. This is the road to Yellowstone. Notice the electric wires and poles. Uh, they had electricity up there. Bob, you can get into that better than I. Yeah, we found an article uh, that in 1910 they were doing electrical improvements at Pahaska. So there was a hydroelectric plant that was installed in the Middle Fork, and it's uh, just above the ski trails up there, about a quarter mile further up in the bottom. And it's a big concrete hydroelectric plant, you know, big, you know, not big like in, you know, Cody Labs out here, but pretty good size for up there. And of course, it's a monument. It's not going anywhere. And, uh, but they had electricity at Pahaska, and evidently right after 1910. And also they had running water and a pressurized water system. Next. This is the Cody Auto Club at Pahaska, I think. And uh, it, it shows you, uh, they, they had an outing. And uh, they were actually able to go up and back to Pahaska in a day. This is like the jet age, you know? <laughs> How do you get that? <laughs> <laughs> By comparison. Yeah. And you can see the sign over there on the left that you saw in the other photo. It's, it's really a. There's another picture of it a little bit later on. Yeah. That was quick. Yeah, I think this might have been the opening day of Yellowstone for automobiles, but I'm not sure. Next. There's that sign. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, those were the days. Next. Notice you, the gear that's packed on the sides of the cars. So the, the car on the right, they've either unloaded the gear or they're just on a day drive. But the car on the left, is obviously on a Yellowstone excursion trip, and they've got all their gear and stuff. They're going to spend the night up in there. Just another vehicle getting ready to go to Yellowstone. Notice lots of spare tires. Yeah. Next. <laughs> and also notice right here on the driver's door, there's a logo. This is probably a Yellowstone park bus. That could be. That's a private vehicle. Mm -hmm. Next. I guess you wouldn't have known you were at Pahaska if you saw, didn't see the sign. <laughs> yeah. Note in the back part of the hotel, there was an addition that was added uh, later on in uh, what, the 20s, and then was there through the early 50s or late 50s and then torn down. The Forest Service pretty much condemned it and forced my father to tear it down. And I helped light the fire when we burned it down by the river. I remember that very clearly. <laughs> and you might notice that the, the spelling of Pahaska teepee. Most people can't spell it. And that's funny, it's teepee they can't spell. <laughs> it's, it's spelled right there. Yeah, it is. Um, Here's one with lights. Uh, nice entrance. This is a look I'd like to take back and re recreate up there with the, the two posts. There's a better look at it. And see the three, the three cabins over there on the left. They're still there. Yeah, they are. Next. Yeah, we're not sure what's burning there, but uh, <coughs> you see there's also smoke on the left, probably slash piles. White man's fire. It's a continual process cleaning the woods up there. This is Kid Wilson and one of the original white touring buses. Kid yeah. Wilson's driving, I think, right? He yeah. is, and uh, mm -hmm. that's the Irma Hotel behind, and he's picking him up. You see the sign on the Irma? Helen heading to Yellowstone. This is after they opened the park to vehicles. Kid Wilson had the Cody garage 
which was across the street, across uh, Sheridan Avenue from uh, the Irma Hotel. And in the 1930s, Earl Corder bought the building and turned it into the Cody Theater. Well, and the picture was probably taken in July. And uh, they weren't getting up that road in June. You know, and you could probably get to Pahaska starting sometime in, I think, mid-June. But, uh, you know, the spring washouts, and it was a continual process just to keep that road open. Uh, you look at the highway department, that what they deal with today, it was five times as bad in those days, at least. First day they allowed cars in the Yellowstone Park, and this was the old gate. They wouldn't let that show up that way today, but uh, uh, that's the superintendent meeting and greeting the Cody uh, Chamber of Commerce and everybody coming up from Cody to drive into Yellowstone. And that was August 2nd, 1915. I thought that was you for a minute there. <laughs> You know, you know I'm a lot younger. Yeah. Careful, I'll tell some stories about you as a youngster. <laughs> Next. Well, this is Horace Albright, in case anybody yeah. wants to know. He was, at that time, superintendent of Yellowstone National Park and the assistant secretary of the interior to, Tom, or to uh, Mr. Mather. The great man. That's the Coney cars headed to Yellowstone. This is down by Absorca Lodge, where they had a washout. In fact, if you were up the North Fork this fall, they were repairing this road again. Right there, yeah, in that same spot. And uh, yeah, there's several pictures here, and they're just really tiny, the originals were, but it gives you an idea what it was like. And, uh, this is one of their new improvement bridges, and this is right by Rimrock Ranch there. Canyon Creek. Next. This is a picnicking at uh, Hanging Rock with a couple park buses sitting there. Those are white automobiles, I believe. Next. That's a postcard from those days. And, uh, and notice how they spelled the Haskin down here. Yeah, yeah, they missed it. <laughs> A -A. We get now, a lot of mail addressed to that address. <laughs> now, the real truth is Mac's grandmother, Aunt Mary Frost, Mary to Ned Frost, was the best poem writer in the world, but she had a little trouble. <laughs> and she didn't go to Cody School. She went to school, became a registered nurse in Chicago. But... Uh, Mac has learned to spell much better. <laughs> this is George Inman. He was a gunsmith, played in the movies we showed a few months ago, and one of the characters that uh, lived here in Cody, and uh, that's in Pahaska. Next. He's pretty well decked out there, too. <laughs> this is kind of a typical winter picture up there, and uh, that's kind of normal snow load for us and uh, dad loved the winter and as soon as you know he was all about the weather <laughs> I guess I am too go ahead this is the snow shovel <laughs> <laughs> the Haska style so this, this is Earl Hainer and Earl of course was uh, real big for Pahaska and, and uh, my dad and Earl were famous friends and uh, Earl, there, some of you might remember the Half Moon Bay down on the North Fork there, and uh, there's a big, big turn around the bay there, and and then Bob Rumsey had his place out there, kind of on the corner right near there. Well, there was a corner there that was real sharp, and uh, I was always told that it was famously known as Earl Hainer's Corner, uh, and uh, I have reason to believe he went off there at least five times. <laughs> One other quick story about Earl, and you'll see him in many photographs. He's the only man that I remember that rode out of a bucking chute at the Cody Stampede on a rocking chair strapped onto a bucking bull. Oh, yeah. yeah. He was famous for it. Next. 
how much you want for that. <laughs> Yeah, this is ski area at Pahaska, and uh, for the, those of you who know Pahaska, um, my house is right on the right side of the picture there where the uh, snow goes up to the right. That's where, I, where my place sits, and uh, it was a rope tow, and uh, my father first came to Pahaska uh, in the 30s and was skiing up there, and I think my mother was also, uh, but they, they really didn't hang out until after, during the war. But uh, it was a big deal, and a lot of people, go ahead to the next one, Mac, I think there's a couple of these. And uh, you see this here, and you can see the rope toe, and uh, I mean, they were proficient, those old wood skis with the, with the bear trap bindings. But you look down there in the middle, you see that kind of uh, uh, odd-shaped building there. That's the Cody Auto Club, and it was built by, uh, Buffalo Bill cut a deal with the Cody Auto Club to improve the highway. And uh, in exchange, he built them a clubhouse up there. It's still there, and uh, it's part of the, the boys' dorm. But if you look into the lines of the boys' dorm up there near the maintenance shop, you can still see the outline of that building there. And uh, Night skiing, they did night skiing. I, I don't know if we have the picture in here, but they were actually night skiing in the 30s at Alaska. And uh, they, uh, uh, it was all generator. You know, REA came in after the war, I believe, and Dad said, no, no, it's too expensive. We're going to keep running on the generator. <laughs> Diesel was cheaper in those days. All right, here on the, with the cross skis is Fred Garlow and Peggy. And I don't know that is. We're pretty sure that's Anco. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I, and, yes, uh, it is. is. Yeah. Uh, so this middle. had to be as we were switching from Crow Creek down to Sleeping Giant. Mm -hmm. And uh, but it's a great shot, and we wanted to add it. Yeah. If you look there, you can still see the rock wall underneath the girls' dorm there. Next. This is uh, out of the old ski lodge at Pahaska. And uh, this all burned down, um, I think. Uh, it's, it's unclear, but this is definitely the part of the uh, ski lodge that burned down. They had a gas mangle in the basement for doing processing the linen at Pahaska. And I say gas because it was gasoline. And they'd had several fires in there and subsequently burnt the whole building down. But Molesworth did the furniture. It was really a beautiful setup. And, uh, this was uh, prior to Dad becoming involved. Beautiful old building. Mm -hmm. There's the old lodge. Note the rifles up over the buffalo mm -hmm. skull. Mm -hmm. Text. You know, and I've looked at this, and I think this is probably the original gift shop at Pahaska, but I'm not positive. And, uh, uh, I don't really recognize anything else. It, it might be Pahaska. Well, it was in the corner of the lodge. Well, uh, this one would have been the main gift shop. Where oh, okay. The, yeah. Yeah. So yeah this is definitely not in the lodge. Okay. And uh, look at the Navajo rug hanging there. Yeah. Yeah. Mom and Dad were real big on the Navajos. Next. There's a ski lodge, and uh, that's before it burned down. And uh, you see it has the dormers up there, and uh, if you look at the building now, you see it's roughly the same size, but it's got a whole different look in the dormers. Next. Well, there's Alma and uh, Bill heading out to Billings, and I... And, uh, Notice what they're carrying. And uh, when Dad... Dad... Uh, Bought the lodge in 1946. Dad bought a partnership with Bill Wilkinson, and uh, there was a. They had a few issues, I think, the first year. <laughs> and uh, so, next year, subsequently, Dad bought them out completely. And I'm not sure this isn't them going out the door. <laughs> next. How, how far is it from Pahaska to Billings? Oh, about a six pack or maybe half a case. 
I bet it was more than that. Be as was moonshine. Here's mom and dad at uh, Aspen Creek. And uh, this must have been right about 1950, 51, I think, on the pictures. And, uh, so dad had this fabulous car collection. And uh, that's the V. Lee and the Calliope. And uh, in, in the back there, you can see the Mercedes, which is a really rare Type S coupe. And uh, we get them all out in line, well, I'll name them for you. But you see the gas pump there on the left? I still have that. And uh, you see, you fill it with gas to, you know, it's got these markers, 5, 10, 15 gallons. And so you fill it with gas. They used to pump it. And I think at this point it was an electric Big pump. hand pump. Yeah. And so you fill it with gas and then you turn the pump off and then you open the petcock and it runs all that gas into the car. That way you knew you were getting 10 gallons of gas. <laughs> and I still have that. And, uh, we're going to get her out and uh, restore it here and probably get it back on display. Let me get the, the names here for the, <laughs> for the cars. And uh, so he had all these cars, and he would always have them in the parade. And so every Fourth uh, of July, it was a big parade production for me and everybody in the family. And then uh, the Vili, which is the yellow one, which is the second from the left there, he would race that at the, at the uh, Cody Stampede against Don Foote. And Don Foote was a very interesting man from Montana that uh, subsequently had uh, a big connection with the uh, Custer Battlefield. And, uh, but anyway, the cars, uh, on the left is the Model T Calliope Ford. It's a 1923 Calliope, and it was a, a circus, circus wagon. And uh, 1910 Vili, that's the yellow one. And then the Mercedes Type S, uh, 1928, which is really, really rare. And the uh, last one I saw uh, went for something like $14 million. Uh, a Crowell cart, 1912. And uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure that's what it is. It might have been the Jefferson Jack Rabbit, but I, I'm clear on that one personally. Uh, next to it is the Jordan Playboy. And the Playboy had a rumble seat in the back where the Elkhart had a mother-in-law seat. Well, <laughs> what's the difference between a mother-in-law seat and a rumble seat? Well, with the kids, they're in the rumble seat because they're outside the back and you, don't, you can't listen to them. But the mother-in-law got to be a little closer. So the, the mother-in-law seat was like if Bob and I were sitting in the front. The mother-in-law seat was right behind them, right here. You know, so she could be right in there. You know. Provide then, guidance to the driver. And then it's a 1934 Pierce Arrow and then the 1930 Rolls-Royce Phantom II. And the right there, and those were all Dad's cars, and uh, he was really proud of them. And he kept them in a in a pole shed up there on the hill by the Reunion Lodge, and they were that's where he kept them for several years till he built the garages in Cody. And they were in the parade Fourth of July every year, all the way through what the seventies. Yeah, yeah, and then I carried it. I kept it up through 1974 or so. This is my dad with Lib Frost, which. Uh, these gentlemen. It's, it's my aunt. These gentlemen know who part she is. Part of the family. And <laughs> the, that's part of the parade gear, and uh, that dad always had. He had those straw hats and everything, and we still have the trunk with the hats in it uh, up there at the old lodge. The thing I always found fascinating about the daily was the circular windscreen right here. Oh yeah, and it traveled around pretty good. It'd go 45, but boy, you were up, you were really rolling. This is an aerial shot of Pahaska. It's probably taken from across the river there, Middle Fork. And uh, it's kind of interesting. You can see the cabins out back there. You can see the, actually see the clubhouse sitting there. And uh, then the station. And if you look at the gas station there, that's been moved around the back and that's the maintenance shop nowadays. And then the gift shop next door there this is a picture is before Dad's influence hit Pahaska. You can see up on the hill, they're building the hill cabins. But uh, uh, the gift shop, when they built the new gift shop, they built it right over the top of that building. 
And so that way they could keep it open for the summer and keep the revenues flowing. So they had the construction, you still walk through the original door, but the building as you know it now is building over the top. And the uh, restaurant had been built like the previous year, the previous uh, two years before, and it, it's off to the right there. This is basically the same picture, but uh, for the back view. And uh, we were talking about the, what I thought was one of the original bridge ab abutments, but way up in the upper right corner. Uh, but I, we've talked about it, I looked at it carefully on my own computer at home, and I'm pretty sure that that was a, a, a river dike that was built by the Forest Service to protect the trailhead over there, one of the first attempts to protect the trailhead. Because it's constantly, the river moves through there right and left. When I first came in, it was on this side, now it's on the other side, and, and it's deeper. It's, it's really something to watch the river. I've been there uh, 30, 38 years, I think. So. I'm sorry. You're well, I've been there longer than that. I've been, I've been running the place for 38 years. <laughs> that's, sister, him honest. that's Sister Anne. I'm sure she can name the horse. And uh, that's one of those buildings we were talking about that we think was uh, brought up from Wapita Lodge. And uh, if you look at the construction, it's real similar. There's, uh, there's still a tax shed uh, back at the barn that's one of those that survived. That's uh, my dad, my Uncle Bill, and my Uncle Bob, uh, all greeting Buffalo Bill. And uh, if you look in the window, you can kind of see the governess up there watching on. And uh, it's, a, it's one of those pictures, family pictures, that's just, you know, it's just priceless. Uncle Bob, uh, well, quickly, Bill, it's all right? Sure. Okay, I don't want you to, you know. Anyway, Uncle Bob, uh, when W.R. died, Uncle Bob bought out the Co Lodge. And so Co Lodge up on Carter Mountain is where this picture was taken. And uh, Co Lodge subsequently burned in a fire in the late 50s. And uh, Dad was coming to town and, uh, from Pahaska, headed to town, looked across the lake and said, oh my God, the lodge is on fire and uh, alerted the fire department, and of course it was a total loss. And, uh, but then Uncle Bob, uh, well, W.R. went back and built the lodge back, and then he subsequently died in 56, I think, or 50, anyway, about right. And, uh, and the, the lodge is there now. And, uh, when the, the museum got it and uh, the realtor got a hold of it, it became Ermel Lake Lodge. But anyway, it was always known as Co Lodge. And Irma Lake is just down below it. The best trout fishing I ever got into. And when grandparents would go up there to visit, I went down and would catch these big, big trout. And then I was taught then to turn them back. Hated that. <laughs> Next. Rainbow trout. This is a Sky Crane helicopter and uh, I believe it, I don't know which fire it's from, but we've had a lot of fires up there, and uh, I'm not sure that it's, it's some, something like five, you know, uh, type A or type one fires in, in seven years or something like that. It's just, it's really quite a string of saving Pahaska up there by the Forest Service and, and the Cody Fire Department. And, uh, Next. This is uh, right there at Pahaska in 88. And uh, you can see the smoke. You can see the minor water truck there. We were scrambling for water trucks. And uh, the river's quite a ways away. Well, the Cody Fire Department had this big plan. And, and uh, so they put an engine in the river and put another engine right there by the A-frames. And then we had a network of inch and a half pipes that went out. It was, it was quite a water show. And we were real proud of ourselves. And uh, I was a fireman. And uh, anyway, uh, on the right there is my brother-in-law, Jim Hayes. And Hank's on top there uh, in front of the truck. And then uh, on, did I say left, it's on the right. And then on the left is Jerry Parker. And I think that's Bob Cress, who was an officer in Cody at the time. Uh, the fire boss came up in 88 and uh, Al Simpson flew around he says, I need to go up there and look at it. So they got him a flight and he drove, flew up there and looked over and 
Jones Creek, and he calls me up. Says, "Bob, there's fire all over back there." And so, so they came in and uh, started aggressively. The Forest Service was putting the fire out, and the Park Service was wanting to let it burn. And so the, we watched the fire come around day after day. And uh, when it actually broke out that morning, the fire boss for the from Cook City, it was all out of Cook City, came over and says, "Oh." This is, a, this is what we're thinking. It definitely couldn't have come this way. And so I asked the question, I said, what's the worst case scenario? I mean, is it tonight, tomorrow? He says, oh, I think you have till Friday. And th this was Tuesday. And so, you know, Jim and Jerry and, and Hank and all those guys were there. And they, so they said, well, we're going to meet tonight down at the fire hall. and." Uh, get our plan together so we're and come up here and we'll have everything set before the fire comes in. Well, that afternoon, there was kind of a little breeze blowing and the fire broke out and traveled uh, 15 miles by three to four miles wide. It was one of the longest, fastest runs of any of the fires to date. There's been more subsequently. It was like a 50,000 acre afternoon blaze. Anyway, it killed a lot of animals up there, but we freaked out at Pahaska, and uh, we, we kicked everybody out of the dining room, you know, get out. And uh, so the foods were left on the tables, nobody paid any bills, we run everybody off. And uh, uh, one of the funny things that happened was uh, the horses all got turned loose, wasn't very funny at the time, because they were freaked out at the barn, and so they turned all the horses loose and run them down the, down the highway. Well, up the highway is coming all the fire trucks and everybody else. It was really a cluster, the North Fork. And you come around the corner by Mormon Creek and the whole mountain's ablaze above Pahaska. It just looks like this is it, you know, apocalyptic. So the next day, uh, we made it through the night. The fire kind of hung tight right by the barn up there. The next day, the helicopter uh, was nowhere to be seen because they were all smoked in at Cook City. And uh, so Al had told me, he says, call me. If there's a problem, call. Uh, he says, I, he was minority whip. And uh, so he says, this is my number. And I have an office right there on the floor. You can call me. So I, I get on the phone and they answer, whip's office. And I say, is Al there? Well, beg your pardon? I say, is uh, Senator Simpson there? <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, about 20 minutes, Al finally came to the phone and he says, by golly, Bob, this is about 10 in the morning. He says, I'm on it. We'll see what we can get done. And we had three helicopters uh, that afternoon, a Chinook, which never managed to drop a bucket. And we had a, a Bell uh, 212, I think it was, or Huey, well, 212 anyway. And it saved the day. And then we had a crew, a uh, uh, command helicopter that managed to make it, but the, the one helicopter saved the day and it had to go for fuel and that broke out and went up the ridge behind Shoshone Lodge there, and, but otherwise uh, the Cody Fire Department kept it from going over the ridge behind Pahaska, but they saved the day. That's the, that's the fire story. Yes. Then, that's John Lounsbury probably during the fire, and uh, he was a Lake District Ranger and Bob's hero, and uh, I'm not sure, they, I think they both feel the same way about each other. John is retired now. He was at Lake for 18 years, and he had the best rapport with everybody in Cody and with Pahaska, and uh, when people went into the park, if you were from Cody and you talked to him, he made sure you got in there. One quick story, uh, we have a uh, relative uh, by the name of Moore that was a veterinarian, and he was crossing into thoroughfare, but he asked to go through the park, and he picked up his dog and put him on the saddle, and one of the seasonal rangers stopped him, wrote him a ticket, taking a dog in to the park, uh, and he argued, fought it, and, John got him off, but uh, Scotty Moore was pretty upset with the Park Service that day that he got a ticket for carrying his dog through the park. But anyway, if you know Scott, you can ask him to tell you the story. Next. John Lounsbury, a great friend of Pahaska. Oh, uh, that's me. 
Can you believe that, youngster? <laughs> Next. That was 88. That's my brother, Hank. Next. Here's some old timers, and we added them. This is Hardy Shull on the right. He was known to be the best moonshiner on the North Fork. <laughs> and uh, when I met him, he was house sitting at the Fred Morris Ranch, and he was married to Fred Morris's wife, sister, and a great friend of my granddad. I can tell you a lot of stories about moonshining and, and the sheriff coming up to check on him. But, uh, anyway, long story short, the sheriff, after he made his ride around, couldn't find any moonshiners, always had four or five bottles of the best moonshine in his car to go back to Cody. <laughs> that, that was Frank Blackburn. Next. Here's another old timer drinking a beer on the right, and that's Earl Crouch. And he found gold up Eagle Creek in the meadows, but it was in the park. And then when the park changed the boundary, Earl went back up and filed on the gold mines. And I first met him selling the Cody Enterprise downtown during World War II when I was a youngster. And I'd go into the Wonder Bar, which is now the Proud Cut, and the old timers would give me a dollar for a paper. And I had five papers my mother gave me to go sell. My dad was overseas and mother was running the paper. And I'd sell the five papers and go back and ask for more. And mother says, that's it, that's all you get. But uh, Earl Crouch grew up with him when I was seven or eight, spent the summer. Uh, he was a cook for Chew Frost, one of the relatives at Eagle Creek. And he'd take me up and show me his mine and his tunnel back 700 feet and uh, his claims, and he had an Ingersoll Rand compressor. He packed all the way up there between two horses, fore and aft. And when they went up the switchbacks, they had to put everything down and turn the horses around and then go up the next switchback. It took him three days to get this Ingersoll Rand compressor in. When he died, I inherited <coughs> it, and uh, we kept the cabin door open. Anybody could use it. and. Uh, I went in the service, didn't have to worry about it. Came back and we had the uh, Wilderness Act that was passed and the Forest Service says, if you're gonna keep your mind, you have to cut a road in here, you have to put a mill site in. And I said, I don't want a road going into those meadows. And uh, we had a big argument and they finally said, well, this is the way it's gonna be, so I signed my title of the mine's over, and they guarantee me that there'll never be a mine up in the Eagle Creek Meadows. Enough of a sideline story. Bob, you get the next one. Yeah, you got your minute there. <laughs> <laughs> next. He's holding me to a tight schedule here. <laughs> so the, the nightly campfire was a regular tradition when I was a youngster. And, they were always out front of the old lodge there and I had speakers that played the taps right about dark and everybody from the campgrounds would come up and they'd sing Home on the Range and Oh Susanna and Coming Down the Railroad. Pretty, a pretty neat deal. This is uh, probably one of the predecessors to that. But this is the Pahaska crew here. There's Earl Hainer on the left and uh, uh, I don't remember his name uh, Bus Arnold. Yep. And my sister Ann's got her back to it. My brother Hank's looking at, the f looking at us there. And then I, th I believe that's Aunt Ruth right behind Hank and uh, on the right. And then right behind Hank is uh, Aunt Rhoda, who you might remember Charles. Charles is in the first row here, his grandmother. And uh, then my mother, Peg, on the right. Next. Yeah, this is Bus and uh, Earl out there having a hard day chaining up the Pahaska truck at the ranger station. Next. Yeah, and Harry Wilson, I think, is who that is with Earl. Next. Oh, no, we got to watch this slide here for just a minute or two. Okay. Check, check out the model here, old stag. Yeah, <laughs> good point. <laughs> and then this, uh, this calendar up here, Cody Laundry. <laughs> The Vargas girl. Yeah. 
1950. 1950, yeah. This is what was known as a man cave. That's what was known as a lodge on the North Fork. Next. Uh, th that was one of Dad's cars, and uh, I want to say it's a 59 Jag, and uh, it's really quite a car. And you can see the pump there, the dispenser in the back. And the, the, the girls' dorm with the dormers up there, uh, where the ski lodge used to be. There's Dad, and that's one of those cabins we were telling you about in the background there. And my brother Hank. A 1952 license plate on the car. Yeah, yeah, Cadillac. Cadillac. There's Hank. I think that's one of the best photographs we've got right there. Yeah, you know, uh, you look. I look at that, and it's like Ann and Hank and Bob all grew up this way, and we were cleaning windshields at the gas station and bussing tables and. Sitting around singing at the campfire, you know, that's what I, that's the way I grew up. And there's more of those buildings. In the yeah, back. you can see those cabins there. Well, that's Earl Hainer in front of the, the Pahaska store, probably in the late 40s. Yeah, this is uh, Dot and Leonard Morris with my mother, and uh, they're up there and they're probably at the new house, which was uh, our house at Pahaska. And uh, mom had uh, built it. They, uh, it's pretty interesting. The first thing they built was a residence and the hill cabins. And uh, the, the residence uh, subsequently burned down in 1985 and we rebuilt the reunion lodge up there. One quick note, Dot in the red coat posed for Ed Grigware, the a photograph that used to hang at the Holiday Inn, the Bottoms Up Lounge with a woman with the chaps and her cheeks showing. Mm -hmm. It's now put away in a basement and sad, but uh, she posed for that uh, Ed Grigware. Next. Yeah, this is the, the, the iconic sign at Pahaska. It's been there forever. If you look underneath it, it's got a, a, a rock monument type deal that my dad, had collected all these rocks and made them a part of that original sign. And we went around and around with the Forest Service over the years about the sign. And, and uh, at one point, they wanted us to put it 100 feet from the highway, parallel to the highway. And, uh, you know, which at Pahaska might work out, but some of these other lodges, that might be kind of tough. And, uh, but uh, there used to be a, a Pahaska Red Star, or a Texaco Red Star that hung on the sign there. And boy, was there a fight about that. And so Dad got pictures of the Texaco truck parked out front of Pahaska and, and, uh, and then did a little study and realized that gas sales took a big jump whenever that truck was deli delivering a Pahaska. Took it back to Washington against the Forest Service and won. And uh, that's how uh, you see on the forest today that gasoline signs are accepted. There's the new A-frames. They were brand new and the uh, family built them at that time just as a temporary thing for like eight or 10 years when they were gonna come in with real proper cabins. And they're still there today and uh, they're, they're workhorses. Front of the lodge. Kind of a, a funny story about the front of the lodge was is that it used to slope, you know, down towards the highway, and so you'd park out front. Nobody had park in those days. You had emergency brake and low, you know, manual transmission. Well, about four to ten times a summer, a car would roll across the highway and off the edge. <laughs> Didn't have the brakes set properly. <laughs> okay, go on. Here's a winter shot. When um, we're open in the winter, you can see they got uh, firewood and. The, Restaurants open. Another vintage picture from Baska. You can see the gift shop in the back. This is uh, the root cellar Baska. It's still there. And Al Ryder, who is uh, Kenny Ryder, a lot of you guys know Kenny from Heron Cody. He was a fire chief and whatnot. Real good guy. 
passed away a year or so ago, but his uh, dad built the root cellar at Pahaska, and there's, in the middle there, you can't see it on the sign, but it's, he's actually written in the concrete in 1930-something, I think. Here's one of Dad's Cadillacs getting filled up out of that dispenser. Right in front of the, that's now the maintenance shop, but used to be the gas station. There's the reunion lodge. It's, uh, it's got uh, seven bedrooms. Three of them are singles and four of them are doubles. All queen beds. It's got 11 queen beds in there. That's a pretty nice facility too. Yeah, it's great for reunions or small retreats or uh, it's pretty flexible building. This is basically what replaced the, uh, the your residence house? Yes. Uh, but in order to build it, the uh, Forest Service insisted that it had to be had to have accommodations for the traffic. Well, that's not quite how it went. Oh, okay. uh, <laughs> they, uh, they said, well, we're not going to let you build that up there. And I, and I, Gary Carver comes to mind. But anyway, uh, so I, I said, well, I'll tell you what, we're going to build it just like it was. It's going to be my family's residence up there, and we're not going to allow a single guest in it the whole time. Oh, and so th there was about three, two or three months went by. And uh, all of a sudden, one day, we got the permit. <laughs> <laughs> they, they really liked the idea that we were going to make it into a commercial building, you know, and that it wasn't going to be our residence up there, which they kind of hang their hat on. One of the front cabins, that's uh, one of the original cabins there. Now there's, there's an interesting bear. Supermoon got us this bear. And uh, it's pretty good, except it's got the Chinese ears. Uh, they, <laughs> they face the wrong direction. <laughs> yeah. We have bears at Baska, and, and there's the DeSoto right behind them there. But uh, we had these cubs that kind of adopted and went to the Cleveland Zoo, I believe. And, uh, but they... Uh, the bears at Pahaska were always, the black bears were always an issue. And uh, you can see the, the DeSoto's got the light on top. Well, Dad bought the DeSoto also as a town car, but the main function was to load people up in it and fill it up after the, uh, the evening dinner and take them down to the dump, which is right down below 50 mile, or below, uh, above uh, the three mile campground and show them the bears with the spotlight on the DeSoto. <laughs> yeah. And there's the, the Cody Peak Monument, and uh, it was dedicated in 1932, like it says. Well, when I was growing up, it had several, you know, high-power rifle shots and was pretty well destroyed and vandalized. And so they came back and redid it. And this is the new one. And uh, it has a little story, too, because uh, Governor Geringer was slated to come up. We were going to dedicate the highway. And uh, anyway, true to form, Yellowstone had a, some sort of incident at Fishing Bridge with a possible fugitive. And they wouldn't allow the governor to come to Pahaska or come up the valley. <laughs> so it never did actually get dedicated. But uh, Paul Hoffman really did a lot of groundwork on this. There's the lodge as it looks today. And here's Linda. Hi, Linda. She's in front here. And uh, she's, she's working on our history, and we're, we're dredging up everything we can on my family, the Shaw family, and the Pahaska, and she's leading the effort. And Bob, too. And notice the paint here in the background. We're going to see that here in a minute. This cutout of Buffalo Bill was given to me by Paul Fees for, and the museum. And there's Ron. And Ron's really a great guy. He comes out. He's been with us I don't know how many years. Five, six. and uh, Yeah. And uh, he's really a wonderful guy. And he and Linda do the uh, honors of tour guiding at the, at the old lodge. There's Michael. And Michael uh, was truly loved by, by all of us at Pahaska. And he... Uh, 
the reason he's here is that one, all the managers, when they came to work in the morning, there he sat outside the door waiting to go in and clean the restrooms. And uh, he uh, would come to work at 3.30 in the morning and he would always uh, make sure the grills were lit at five so that at six o'clock when the chefs or, or the cooks arrived that we'd, uh, coffee was made and whatnot. And you know, these things are important to make this place work. And Mike was just a, I mean, he was there every day for 15 years or longer. How much? 20, 25 years. And wasn't he also your winter keeper? Yeah, he was a winter keeper. He so he a lot of times in the winter he was there by himself. And, uh, your dog was generally out there quite often. Oh yeah, yeah. Michael was real close with the dog and Starley, and so their their ashes are spread together there. At Pasco. Yeah. Next, this is Bob's mascot. When I was up there photographing uh, this summer the inside of the lodge came out and on the steps I sat down next to this little rascal and he wouldn't move. And I got right down there with my camera and I said, you like this place, don't you? And he finally got up and wandered in uh, underneath the building, but sunning himself and I couldn't resist that photograph. Next. I recall a family of foxes that lived underneath the, the pilings of the uh, well, we didn't put them in. No, we didn't. <laughs> we also didn't put in the uh, Pine Martin that had been living there and still are a problem. Oh, yeah, we caught three Pine Martins in the last week in the kitchen. <laughs> we re they, they entered the Bob Co. relocation program. <laughs> Down the road a couple of miles, you know. This is some of the artifacts uh, that have been collected over the years that are inside the old lodge. Next. Plates that were at the Irma as well as at Pahaska in, during Buffalo Bill's time. And they're in the lodge. Next. Well, this is, this is a picture of Annie Oakley uh, that was uh, uh, by my grandmother Effie Shaw. And Effie was instrumental in Cody and actually in the, one of the uh, forefathers of this institution. And she was uh, real big on the history of Cody and uh, one of the first school teachers of Wapiti School. Next. This is a A. a. Anderson photo or a, a painting. oil painting of uh, uh, the fireplace at Cool Lodge. And this is the one that burned down. and. They saved the fireplace, so the fireplace is in the new building there, it's still there. Next. This is the soda fountain at Pahaska, and uh, you know, they say it was at the World's Fair, it probably was, it was probably at the Irma too before it got moved up to Pahaska, and, uh, but it's pretty interesting. Go well, ahead, Bob. Well, <laughs> Here? <laughs> no. <laughs> Those are chamber pots. <laughs> Otherwise known as thunder mugs. Yeah. <laughs> and they're now displayed, but they were for the rooms there in the old yeah, lodge. Yeah. yeah. Next. This is the plumbing. Portable. <laughs> Notice the A's above the fireplace. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's two sets of them there. It's really striking in there. Next. There's the, the box of hats for the, uh, the parade. And uh, the, the old lodge, you know, we do special events in there. We occasionally we'll do a wedding in there or dinners or whatnot. And we had the Prince of Monaco there. A couple 2013. Of years. Yeah, 2013 we had the Prince and hosted a big dinner there with the museum. There's the skull, it's still there. You can see the crack in the fireplace. Mm -hmm. Next. You might point out the people, the uh, Indian kill. Oh yeah, that's an Indian kill. You see where they knocked the cavity of the brain out and got the brains out of there. They used that for tanning and softening of the hides. And those benches, uh, Linda, do we know yet where they came from? They came from the pavilion. From the pavilion. 
Yeah. Uh huh. Next. And uh, it was obvious they came from somewhere. And Linda's dug up and figured that out. That they were in the pavilion. This is the boathouse. And uh, Dad had a boat, and a uh, Yellowstone Lake boat. And uh, he kept it in this boathouse. And it has the facilities to lift the boat so you can work on the bottom. Uh, it was all built out of log. And then uh, we keep the tack shed, keep the Wranglers up there. Here's the boat that he had. It was a Chris Craft, a very beautiful boat. But Bob, I'll let you talk on this one. The, one of those is uh, the co-boat, I think the front one. Way back near the back. You can just see it. Oh, way on the right. Yeah, that's probably it. And then Husky Oil, Paul Stock. Uh, had a couple of boats up there. And then Jack Manning had a boat, and Manning kept a suite in the hotel, and he used to pat me on the back, and he says, there's a Yellowstone Law, and there's Manning Law. And out he'd go with his boat and catch a mess of fish, and we never touched him. He came back, and he had Eisenhower here for a big meeting and several days at the hotel, and they'd fry all the fish they caught there. But that's the old boat docks in front of Lake Hotel. Jack Richard photo. For those of you who don't know, Bob was a park ranger, and a tough one, I think. And uh, gentle. <laughs> anyway, he had the last laugh because uh, the Cody Elks Club had this huge fishing trip up there, and uh, it was a huge debacle. Of, uh, who knows how many thousands of fish they ate? Dot Island. And uh, anyway, uh, they shut them down. They caught them and threw them off the lake and never come back. And you know. That's when they moved down to Boise Reservoir. Yeah, they've been in Boise. <laughs> Moving right along. <laughs> Bob put this picture in there. It's the corrals as he remembers it. And uh, you know, and, uh, it's uh, back there at Crow Creek. And most of you have never seen the corrals. But it's on Crow Creek. It's right at the edge of Crow Creek, at the edge of the north of Sorka Wilderness there. And there's bears and whatnot around there. That's the way it looks today. Next. That's the ice house. And uh, it, even in the late 50s, they were using the ice house. And uh, they, there's a pond out back there, and they'd cut ice in the blocks, like 16-inch blocks, and then store it in there uh, in sawdust. And when I was a kid, I can, well, when I first worked at Pahaska, I guess is when it was, early 70s, uh, there was still packed f clear full of sawdust in there and uh, where the ice had been and the tongs were pulling the ice and the saws were all there. Next. Yeah, this is uh, uh, some of the history work we did. And uh, this is one of the, I think this might even be the one that talks about the, the electrical coming to Pahaska. But on top is, uh, why don't you talk about that? Well, this is Chew Frost advertising pack trips. He took me up there in 54 and said, here's 60 head of horses. You're the wrangler, you rent them out. And he says, turn them out on the hillsides at night. And he says, get these horses in shape. I says, what does that mean? He says, rent them out every day. So at three in the morning, I would be wrangling the horses and had to have them saddled and down by the old lodge by 8 o'clock. And by 5 o'clock, I'd take them back up, unsaddle them, turn them loose. And let me tell you, those early mornings got old very fast. And uh, anyway, let's keep going. Well, Linda, this is Ray right. McCoy, Linda's husband. Ray passed away this summer, but he was somewhat of an icon on the North Fork and Pahaska. And Best darn dude wrangler we ever had that I knew of. And the best horses. Mm -hmm. Gentle. Yeah. And the best, best mustache, too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he had a good handlebar mustache. We all miss Ray. This is the, uh, these were the placemats. And uh, if you look at this, you can see the map. And this is all Grigware. This is uh, done by Grigware from my, I'm commissioned by my dad. And uh, if you look at the map on the right side, you can see what Bob's done here. And he's recreated the maps. And uh, he's, he's got a new plan that he's projected to me. We're going to try to come out with them again. But they're really a fabulous map of the, the North Fork. Come up and take a look of it 
after the show, and uh, and uh, I still have the original lead plates from the original printing of the map. It's also in my first book, Cody to Yellowstone, on yeah. where all the places are. Yeah. But uh, so there's a map, and they're upstairs for sale. I guess I guess you could say that's when we first started working together. Well, that's. I met you when you were still in diapers. I'm not uh, sure what happened. <laughs> I was working for you then? Uh, no, but I was working against, for your mother. Then I was against him. <laughs> oh, we yeah, got that got again. I got this one in here, a second one, same that, picture. And that's uh, Angela and myself. Angela's in the front row here. And uh, give her a big cheer because part of the reason past is successful. <laughs> And Here's we, another. Yeah, well, Angela and I, uh, we go travel down to New Mexico buying jewelry, and Ernie here, he's the, the, the uh, salesman there, the, the trader, I guess is. This is in his vault, and uh, so he starts dredging up these big fancy necklaces, and uh, they're bickering over a price there. And, uh, <laughs> but if you look on the right, you see that jar sitting there on the right? Those are all turquoise nuggets. And, uh, Underneath the vault, he has another vault down there, and he has all these mason jars of turquoise. And uh, just like that, gallon jars, clear full of turquoise. This really, really rare, hard to get turquoise that they're selling by the gram now. And uh, anyway, Ernie's quite a guy. And uh, anyway, the funny thing is that the price that he was giving us, we took, and uh, then we got home and he, uh, Somehow they'd forgotten the price, and uh, it didn't show up on the invoice, and Angela made a call, and I straightened it right up. <laughs> but if you want to buy good turquoise, talk to Angela. She's very knowledgeable. Yeah, she is. Next. Oh, look at there. Is, is that a relative? got names on yeah. it. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, Stu Stresser was the district ranger, and she was, she was really pretty good. And uh, then Bill's right in the front row here. And uh, then myself and Ann's on the right. Uh, it's it's kind of part well, of the lodge business. What do we got here? And uh, Rob's kind of getting in the lodge business, you might say. And uh, <laughs> he's been my manager for three years now, four years. And he's doing a great job. Seven years? Oh my gosh. Sign of aging. I have a little bit of history with uh, Rob as well. He was uh, one of the. Uh, Concessionaires and eventually my assistant manager when I was running the Cody Theater for Bob and Sandy Vincent. He was pretty good hand. Well, he's a great hand. You didn't hear that, Rob. <laughs> he's a great hand, but as you know, at Pahaska, you're going to learn to be a line cook. Uh, I did. I <laughs> did. This is a photograph I stuck in right out of Pahaska at the East Gate, and most of you have never seen that. You're looking east, and when you go through the east gate on your way out, you're looking at the rangers, the traffic going through, but behind you is Sleeping Giant Mountain, mm -hmm. and Bahaska's right below it. Anyway, a different view of the east gate in Bahaska. Next. This is Bob, the prince, and myself in 2013 when he was here. And we had a big celebration up there at lunch. And uh, uh, it was quite a celebration. He's got uh, Sheriff Scott Stewart's badge. <laughs> we asked him for it, and Scott just took it off and pinned it on. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I have reason to believe that Scott doesn't do that very often. <laughs> <laughs> Next. This is the uh, wilderness legacy and the. Uh, it's right there, I think, in front this, of the lodge. This is a plaque right out in front of the old, the old lodge there. It's, uh, we put it there. And the tree, the Camp Monaco tree, is, I think it's on display down here. It, it is. It's, it's in, in the yeah. Buffalo Museum. Buffalo Museum. Used yeah. to be in the uh, fire museum. Next. This next one here is a video clip that was taken out of the uh, videos, the old 35 uh, millimeter footage that was shot during the Camp Monaco affair. And this one is kind of interesting because one, it has family members and then some historical characters. Here we have Fred Richard, Bob's grandfather, leading the hunting party out of camp. 
This is the Prince of Monaco, Albert the First. They all look pretty good. This is A.A. A. A. Anderson, and there's his son, our patron saint. <laughs> <laughs> Preparing camp, Buffalo Bill chopping a log and dropping the tree right into the fire. <laughs> <laughs> Looks like the tree in the background. Uh, yeah. you see that? Yeah. Anyway, we went over time, but we will take questions. Those of you that need to leave, please. Uh, thank you for coming, and we will now take questions, and we'll take a mic to you if you have questions, and we will cut it off uh, if it slows down or at two o'clock. Bob and I have to I have to go upstairs and sign books. <laughs> Any questions for Bob and Bob? You still have the cars? What was that? No. You still have all those cars? Do no, still, my I you still have all the do you still have all the cars of your dad's? Yeah, uh, no. Uh, the answer short is no. It, my uh, mother and brother and the rest of the family got rid of the cars while I was in high school. Oh, and so oh. I that's what's the end of that. I, I still keep a few cars. I've got a, a 1957 Imperial, a 19, the 47 uh, DeSoto, which is there, and then uh, I've got a 68 Charger RT that my sister had. Yes, ma'am. Yes. The best part of, Ch of going to Pahaska in the winter was having dinner. Any chance of uh, opening a restaurant in the winter? Yeah, opening a restaurant in the winter. Uh, I won't do it, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's a no. I, I think there's a chance. You know, uh, the the biggest problem with winter was is, you know, of all the years that we operated winter, which was like 25 years, maybe 28, 30. We fought with the Park Service relentlessly with keeping the gate open. They didn't want us there. And finally, when I succumbed and got out of the winter business, they thought they were going to be able to close the east entrance and be done with me. And uh, the city of Cody had other ideas, and there was a tremendous protest. Not, I wasn't a part of it. I, was, I guess you could say I supported it. But uh, there was a huge protest in Cody with a public hearing, and, uh, and uh, as you can see, the park had to keep the east gate open. Uh, Gary Fells, Rimrock Ranch, runs snowmobiles into the park. I think they have about 23 snowmobiles now. We were running 42 snowmobiles at the end, and uh, we were having groups of snowmobilers come across the park, uh, 15 or 20 at a time, to spend the night with us, eat dinner, eat breakfast, and move on. And that's what made the business work. And uh, it's, there's so much overhead uh, with that large lodge. We had 23 employees in the wintertime. And uh, the snowmobiles, and it just, you know, all I can tell you is I've made money ever since I got out of the winter business. <laughs> <laughs> Next. Yes. 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 When? May, may I clarify the Teddy Roosevelt non-statement? Yeah. Um, he came to the park in 1904. Roosevelt Arch out there in the park by Mammoth. Never came here. At the time he was there in 1904, the road to Yellowstone was like 70 miles because, as you mentioned, it had to go back and forth, back and forth. According to the research I've done, Dave Jones' daughter, in her eulogy for her dad, said that her dad coined the and he was very active in the Cody Chamber. So Teddy Roosevelt never said that, and Jeremy Johnston and I have been fighting that battle for at least 15 years. Well, I'm in the tourist business, and guess which side <laughs> <laughs> I'm on. <laughs> One note, in this book we don't say that it was uh, the most scenic 52 miles is what we said. We didn't say by anybody. Yeah, I, yeah, it's hard to say. And yes, sir. <laughs> um, sorry, you mentioned one of the earliest electrical generation um, things 
was uh, about a quarter mile from the Nordic Ski Trail. Is that um, that stone structure that's up what we call the Jackson Hill along the Nordic Ski Trail? No, this was in the bottom of Middle Fork. And uh, so the, the Middle Fork Trail that runs down there where it climbs and comes back up to the highway, it's about a quarter mile up the valley from there in the bottom. Uh, yes, west, towards yeah, the park. Is that like a natural spring, uh, that stone structure? Oh, no, it was, uh, it was fed out of Middle Fork. And uh, it had used the Middle Fork water, and it was susceptible to, uh, to floods. And, and they had a few issues. But for all the old timers here, they always remember Middle Fork was always very clear. And uh, it's just recently that they've had the fires up there on this side of the pass that has gotten where it flows mud in the summertime. Mm -hmm. And is that stone structure up on the hill up above, is that like as a water source for the pastor? Oh, or yeah, that's our cistern. And so, uh, you know, the cistern's a big deal because of water supply. And the, the, so my dad constructed the cistern up there, and it's 12 by 12 by 12. And so it's roughly 10,000, 12,000 gallons of water, which is huge for a, a fire source. And uh, it's nice. And uh, so the fire district came in and uh, helped us in 1986 or so, and we put a six inch pipeline from the cistern down to the lodge. And so now we have fire hydrants down at the lodge that flow like 1,200 gallons a minute. So for, it's, a, it's a great resource for the fire district. And, uh, but that's our cistern up there. And the water source comes from down below the A-frames there, up the river a little bit. And it's, uh, it's a spring-fed crib, if you will, about 10 feet underground. And uh, so the surface water treatment rule, which is an EPA thing, they, uh, because it's subject to groundwater, they require us to filter the water, to, uh, we UV treat it, and we also uh, chlorinate it. And uh, so we could put a well in. And, and just solve the whole problem. And we've thought a lot about a well. It'd be, probably be pretty easy to do. But then Pahaska has this really incredibly good water. And uh, so we, we stuck with the original water good. system. Any more questions? Thank, Thank you guys for coming. Thank you. Bob will be upstairs to our sign books. Thank you very much. We'll see you in January.